One of the most memorable moments of Humboldt State to me was when my grandfather died. I was over here at Humboldt as a sophomore and I was only 18, about ready to turn 19 years old. And uh, Dr. Ralph Hassman was the wrestling coach at the time, and I was a wrestler. And he came and sought me out at Redwood Hall in my room, said he needed to talk to me, and he informed me of my grandfather's death. And uh, I really appreciate it because he was a, a real caring man. Dr. Asman, and he, I did not have a car, I had no way to get home, and he informed me that he had uh, canceled the rest of his day here as a faculty member, and all he wanted to do is put me in the car and drive me over to Weaverville, which is a bit three hour drive one way, to meet my dad who had called him, and that was a very touching moment. I'll never forget it to, for a faculty person to care that much about a student. Humboldt State University is now 100 years old. It's an exciting milestone and a time of great pride for everyone who has been a part of the campus community. A lot can happen in a century, and a lot has. Humboldt State's story is complex, marked by big ideas and day-to-day -day challenges, high ideals and bare-knuckle politics, boom year expansions and wartime declines. At its heart, it's a story about thousands of people and thousands of dreams all coming together in one unique place. The story begins in late 1911 when local citizens started organizing to win support in Sacramento. Education was prominent on the national agenda and they wanted progress for their community. But it was a long shot. Humboldt was extremely small and isolated. Travel in and out was still by boat or on poor dirt wagon roads. Stubborn effort won the day. Things became official on June 16, 1913, when Governor Hiram Johnson signed the bill creating Humboldt State Normal School. Its mission? Training future school teachers. The uh, entire guest hall was College of the Elementary, and some rooms had one-way glass where you could observe the classroom. I think in my junior year, we actually went into the, into the classrooms. In fact, uh, Harry Griffith, who Harry Griffith Hall is named after, uh, was one of the principals there, and then he went on to become the head of the education department. After a heated rivalry with Eureka and Fortuna over the location of the school, Arcata promoters, including William Preston and the Union Water Company, won out. They pledged land that would eventually become campus, and there were financial pledges from other residents. Early on, while a number of community leaders were interested in having the campus here and saw it as a benefit to the community, there, was also, there were also a number of people who didn't like the uh, campus here. They thought it took away from the original purpose of the town, which is more related to timber and that part of the economy. Classes began on April 6, 1914, with 62 students. The school was temporarily at 11th and M Street in a small building along the railroad tracks. It was a drab place, and so close to the railroad tracks that classes halted when trains rumbled past. Nelson Van Matre, a former superintendent of Eureka City Schools, became Humboldt State's first president. In December of that year, Susie Baker Fountain 
became Humboldt State's first graduate. And on May 26, 1915, the first graduating class was honored. Fifteen women, wearing gowns they sewed themselves, took part in ceremonies at the Minor Theater. As World War I began, enrollment fell. In 1918, there were only two male students. Still, the school persevered. It wasn't until 1922 that work was finished on the main building, later known as Founders Hall. The school's first permanent structure replaced a slew of temporary buildings. Students and faculty were excited about it, though they had concerns about the arches and doorways that were originally open to the weather. In those years, vocational training, such as horticulture, agriculture, and domestic sciences, were a large part of the education. Courses in soils and livestock were precursors of today's programs in natural sciences. For students, the redwood trees, rivers, and coastline have always been an ideal backdrop for learning and for exploring. A lot of the guys were crazy about salmon fishing, and so in before half an hour, yeah, hour and a half before daylight every morning, we <clears throat> we'd, uh, we'd truck out to Mad River and go salmon fishing, and then and then come back to the to the university f to fall asleep in our in our morning classes. And those fell I still remember really clearly, and a lot of those young men that I encountered out on Mad River before daylight. One student's letter home in 1927 extolled Humboldt's natural beauty while adding a lament about the university's many hills. It is true, is it not, she wrote, that gaining an education is uphill work? The ensuing decades would usher in periods of rapid growth, tempered by times of austerity and regrouping. Through it all, Humboldt maintained a strong sense of community that would come to define the campus. In the early 20th century, college professors usually maintained an air of formality, but not at Humboldt State Teachers College. I really enjoyed my professors. We are, were few in number, so we just had, we just, we're one big family. <laughs> we all but pretty much know everybody else. And uh, I think that was part of it that made it so special. Professor Horace Jenkins was a great example. For years, Pop Jenkins would cook soup and beans in a large iron pot on campus. It was the day's only warm meal for many students during the Great Depression. It was a time when there wasn't much money around, so I'm telling you, I lived on a dollar a week for food. That's all my dad could spare. And my roommate also brought about that much, but we bought, brought things from home, of course. But you could buy hamburger for 15, 20 cents, carrots and spaghetti, and that's about what we ate. Never thought about being starved or hungry. Or, although there are times when uh, we'd sit in the cafeteria and use ketchup and hot water for soup. <laughs> it was free. Pop Jenkins was among many fondly remembered faculty of the time, a group that also includes Homer Balabanus. Mr. Humboldt, who arrived in 1923 and worked closely with four Humboldt state presidents. For me and for the faculty, uh, Homer Balabanus was the visionary. He had a classical Greek education based on his knowledge of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, he was highly influential. As the campus grew, that sense of camaraderie and cooperation deepened. The school's second president, Ralph Sweatman, kept up the outreach to the community. He gave speeches, attended functions, and participated in service clubs boosting Humboldt State's profile in the area. 
Students embraced campus life from the beginning, taking part in activities and establishing campus clubs. They put on the first school play in 1914, sending proceeds to help victims in war-torn Europe. In 1924, the school created Associated Students, an alumni organization, and the first school newspaper, The Foghorn. The school also started Work Day, a tradition that continued for many decades. On Work Day, students and faculty would clean the campus and take on building projects. The day began with a pep rally and concluded with a dance late into the night. The dance started like eight, maybe, or something, and it went clear until three o'clock in the morning when they decorated for them and we wore formals and we danced cheek to cheek with our boyfriends. <laughs> and the music, the music was like old 40s, or it was 30s actually. Big band was just coming on actually. The same community spirit later led to activities like all-college picnics and then lumberjack days, still fondly remembered and missed by Humboldt alumni. They used to have uh, lumberjack days, which was an unbelievably fun activity. It would run for a week. And it wasn't just for athletes or anybody. As a matter of fact, I think it was just, you know, just everybody showed up. And it would be just packed. I mean, the whole weekend would be just full of cross-cut saw, you know, the whip saw where you have teams and, and log rolling. They used to roll the logs up in the pond behind the, the uh, field house. Collegiate athletics, such as football, basketball, and track and field, added to the sense of school spirit. My father, Earl Miniweather, came here in the 30s to play football. Dad was one of the first blacks to graduate, and I was one of the first to graduate from Arcata High. He was the first black in the Hall of Fame, inducted in 1955. Of course, I came along a little while later. But um, mom and mom came up with him, and um, there's pictures of them riding in the floats. And you know, he came back to Humboldt State in 1971 as vice president of student affairs and ombudsman. He loved this school so much that it was his first choice for everyone to go. One standout athlete, Elta Cartwright, qualified for the first woman's U.S. Olympic team in 1928. When she returned after being eliminated in the semifinals, more than 15,000 community members gathered for a welcome home parade. She was one of five girls and she was the tomboy of the girls. They all were teachers, all came to Humboldt uh, uh, teachers college at that time, back in the late 20s, or mid 20s to late 20s. And she was a wonderful athlete and very fast runner. And she won her first national 50 yard dash in 1925. And she ended up winning five straight national championships in the 50 yard dash, which is pretty extraordinary. But she also did win the Olympic trials when they had the first Olympic trials for women in the 100-yard dash and I believe also in the 50-yard dash. In the fall of 1930, Arthur Gist, a former teacher and elementary school principal, assumed the school presidency. He proved to have a personal touch with the students. I was just amazed at how much interest he took in individuals in public speaking class and we had to do radio work you know, and you wouldn't have thought that he would even be listening to it. But in the morning when I came back to school, I didn't talk like this <clears throat> in those days. And he, he stopped me in the hall and he said, I think you should think about working some on um, radio too, he said, because you have a wonderful voice. So they were really interested, like, like family, in what you were doing. A few years later, work began on Redwood Bowl, a WPA project. It would host its first football game in 1946. The football players would split a shift in, in the mills, and that's why they call them the green chain. There's the defense. <laughs> the, 
of the football team on the defense, it's a green chain, because that's one of the hardest part of the mill is pulling that green chain. It's hard work. But uh, I remember when they had the uh, first football rally, we went downtown, and then from there we went to Eureka, just going around town. It was wild, I mean, you know. In 1939, Germany invaded Poland and World War II was fully underway. It had a profound effect on Humboldt State. The entire campus, students, faculty, and staff mobilized for the war effort. Campus leaders conducted air raid drills and set up an air observation post. The university camouflaged Founders Hall to prevent attack by Japanese submarines. To prepare Humboldt men for military service, the campus established a commando physical fitness program. During the war, I remember going around uh, collecting metal and, and aluminum and stuff from people that could give it up to, for the war effort. There was a, a platform the college built up on the hill, and they were plane spotters. And then once a month, I think, we'd go up and, and fill our stamp book and then buy war bonds. When the war ended, mail enrollment boomed. An entire section of dorms became known as GI Alley. New programs sprung up, like the GI Wives Club and the Veterans Club. We were on the campus, we didn't have enough buildings. And the GI Bill apparently was in full swing because engineering drawing, descriptive geometry, they, were, they all had drawing boards. And, and so on, all ready to go, but the college doesn't have a, have a place to put them. And what I ha had to turn to is tell them, take their drawing birds home and spend the two hours that they should have had in a, in a drafting room. But very shortly, why, we got rid of that, probably within six months, there was a wooden structure south of uh, the main building. And part of that was a part of a gymnasium. So they must have played basketball in there at one time. And, that was the place I put, put the new drafting tables. So we were correcting the problems as fast as we could. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, the Cold War intensified, and there was fear about communism. For a time, Humboldt required graduates to prove their loyalty with a test on U.S. history and the Constitution. By the late 1950s, the Red Scare had subsided. Cornelius Siemens, a Russian-born graduate of the University of California at Berkeley, became Humboldt State's fourth president. He would oversee a tremendous expansion of the college's campus. He was a builder. Facilities were his thing and finances were his thing. So, for example, one of the reasons that Humboldt got state support and grew, in spite of the fact that it had limited enrollment, was because he decided that the thing to do was to build academic programs that required labs that influenced the need for lab facilities and lecture halls and justified support for building them. The late 1950s and 60s saw an anti-war movement, a wave of feminism, and the fight for civil rights. Humboldt State students, faculty, and staff rallied behind various causes, setting the stage for an enduring commitment to activism and social justice. One incident in particular focused nationwide attention on Humboldt. In 1960, Humboldt's undefeated football team boarded a plane to Florida for the national championship. But upon arrival, the team's five black players were forced to stay in segregated housing. 37 faculty members wrote an incensed telegram to the superintendent of public schools expressing their disapproval, and the whole thing caused a national uproar. I was shocked because I was in school at that time. And the way it was told to me was that the coaches went to the players and said, this is the story, this is what Florida's, or the Magnolia Bowl is telling us, what do you want to do? We can stay here, not go. And I thought, well, that would have been a good choice. But of course, that put a lot of pressure on the players, all the players. And the players decided, as I understand it, that they would go. 
and they would live with those arrangements. And um, I didn't understand that that's what they had to do, but that is a really sad situation. The 60s also saw the creation of the annual Humboldt Film Festival, the Clam Beach Run, the Humboldt Honeys Club, and miniskirt contests. After a 10-year hiatus, the marching lumberjacks re-emerged, but this time as a scatter band. It was a time when certain student clubs became well-known for their mischief around campus. The Intercollegiate Knights was a social honorary fraternity with a, a kind of an emphasis on social. So we sold the hot dogs at the football games. And I think we really got in trouble one time because Dr. Seaman's wife had gotten a hot dog without a weenie in it. So <laughs> um, we, we got called on the carpet for that. I had forgotten all about that. That's, that was, we were always in trouble for something. Students protested the arrest of hippies and also rallied around issues like free speech. The campus established a free speech stump and encouraged engagement between students and local citizens. You could speak three minutes, but that was it, and we meant it. And some of the ones that were so sure they were going to dominate and take over the meeting, they got three minutes, period and a couple of them got cut off completely. And, but we had given them the rules, and I liked one, the tradition of free speech, and anything can be said at Humboldt. Everybody got his or her say. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, opposition to the Vietnam War intensified on college campuses. At Humboldt, students held the largest demonstration in the school's history against the U.S. military incursion in Cambodia. Over 3,000 people gathered on the quad. We had been working on a play. We were getting close to opening. And at some point, somebody said, uh, run up and get some coffee. We need coffee. And I said, I'd go. And I went out the other side of the building. And on the quad, the, the quad was filled with people. Um, and there was a microphone set up below the art, on the art steps. And it was a massive thing. And we in the theater department had been just utterly unaware of it. So I went back in and I told my cronies that something was up and we all kind of shut down what we were doing and we came out. And that was a, a life-changing day. There were people on top of the buildings. Um, the crowd just kept growing and growing and growing. There were speakers. And at some point in the day, several of the young men started burning their draft cards. Around the same time, the school underwent its fifth and final name change, becoming Humboldt State University in 1974. Humboldt's fifth president, Alistair McCrone, arrived later that year. President McCrone was very, very much a gentleman. He was almost always dressed in a three-piece suit, even when he went to the basketball games. The one exception would be there was an annual faculty uh, formal party at which he wore his kilt. During his presidency, older campus buildings, including Founders Hall and the library, were renovated. Humboldt State's ethnic, women's, and Native American studies programs grew. Historically, Humboldt State University has been very innovative and started programs for American Indian students here. There were no other programs like ITEP. The Native American Studies Department was the first in the CSU system where students could get a bachelor's degree in Native American Studies. Humboldt's commitment to sustainability and the environment led to several important efforts. In the 1970s, faculty and students helped create the Arcata Marsh for wastewater treatment and as a wildlife refuge. It became nationally and internationally known and had visitors come from various other countries as well as different states to see how it was working. So it was quite an accomplishment and it's still functioning nicely. 
In 1978, students established the Campus Center for Appropriate Technology by retrofitting a house on campus with alternative, eco-friendly systems. In 1987, Humboldt students established the Graduation Pledge of Social and Environmental Responsibility. Over the years, the pledge has been adopted by students at hundreds of universities around the country. In 1989, with a generous gift from Louis W. Schatz, Humboldt State opened the Schatz Energy Research Center, which has been at the forefront of the development of clean energy technologies. A decade later, the Schatz Lab unveiled the country's first hydrogen-powered vehicle. I think one of the most exciting things that, that has happened here is that some students came to me with the idea of taxing themselves $10 a semester to create the Humboldt Energy Independence Fund with a goal of making the university independent of the electrical grid by 2040. And I think that's one of the things that I remember uh, most and an example of the quality of the students that we have here. They're very creative. They've done some very important things here. They come up with good ideas that oftentimes uh, I've had the pleasure of supporting. And I've really enjoyed working at Humboldt State. It's a, a different institution in many ways. I like the students here. Uh, they have a perspective on society and the environment that I have not seen very often at other uh, campuses where I served. During the past two decades, HSU has continued to grow, expanding its curriculum and facilities, recruiting new students, and cultivating distinguished faculty members and alumni. A building boom in the early 2000s led to a number of new and modernized facilities. In 2007, the university dedicated the Behavioral and Social Sciences Building, which was the most environmentally friendly building in the CSU system. The university also completed a new kinesiology and athletics building and College Creek, a housing complex for 400 students. Today, Humboldt State offers majors in fields as diverse as forestry and wildland resources, geography, theater arts, and child development. Many of its natural science programs are nationally recognized. Students have access to an array of special facilities not usually found at similar schools, including a research vessel, observatory, and marine lab. The local natural environment, highlighted by ancient redwood forests, serves as a unique extension of the university's classrooms and labs. Humboldt State and the North Coast community have grown up together. Those earlier supporters who helped get Humboldt State established and who kept it going could hardly have imagined what it would become. The university is now one of the area's largest employers. It is the intellectual heart of the state's North Coast, a seedbed for professionals and entrepreneurs, and a major center for the arts. Far from its humble beginnings, Humboldt State now boasts an enrollment of more than 8,000. Students hail from across California, the country, and the world. And the university's alumni community has surpassed 60,000. They include a nationally recognized expert on bee ecology, the founder of one of the most respected financial firms in the country, and the creative mind behind the popular children's cartoon, SpongeBob SquarePants. On August 24, 2013, HSU kicked off its centennial year with a celebration on the Arcata Plaza. Throughout the academic year, students, faculty, alumni, and others will come together to celebrate how far we've come. Humboldt State now has an extended community that reaches around the globe and stretches back a full century. It has been an eventful, challenging, inspiring, and joyous start. Now, during our centennial celebration, it is time to celebrate all that has been accomplished. It is a time to recognize the achievements of so many dedicated individuals. And it is a time to set our sights to the future to imagine what comes next.